so much for joining us today. Uh, our presentation is Common Law Separations Advanced Topics. My name is Stephanie and I'm an articling student at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. So I'm just going to start off with some introductions, let you know what we have on the agenda for today, and then I'll pass over um, everything over to our panelists. So as we are presenting virtually, we do apologize in advance for any technical issues that may come up. I'll be available throughout for any questions or tech issues. So if you do have any challenges, please contact me. My email is stephanie with a ph at russellalexander.com and I will do my best to resolve the issues. So for our agenda today, our panelists will be discussing the following topics. So the definition of spouse, spousal support revisited, uh, a variety of different property claims, legislation legislative reform and other considerations and torts and damages. So there will also be a question and answer portion at the end of our webinar. So if you haven't already, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A box. You should be able to find that at the bottom tab um, in your Zoom. We have disabled the chat function for the audience in order to keep everyone's identities anonymous. But if you do have questions on today's topic or you need to get in touch with us, you can use that Q&A function to do so. Uh, so we also do ask that you please keep in mind that this webinar is intended to provide general information on family law and should not be considered as legal advice. And just a quick note, we will be providing links to helpful resources mentioned throughout the webinar in a follow-up email tomorrow, so please keep your eye out for that as well. So it is my pleasure to introduce our three lovely panelists today. So Adam. Adam is an associate lawyer at our firm where he practices in all areas of family law, including collaborative family law, divorce, child support, spousal support, domestic contracts, and property-related issues. Adam re represents clients in litigations, negotiations, and various forms of family dispute resolution. He was called to the bar in Ontario in 2013 after graduating from Bond University in Australia. Uh, prior to joining our team in 2015, he practiced both family and criminal law, and if he's not working with clients, he can be found spending quality time with his family or playing sports. And we have Bill. Bill is a managing associate at our firm. His courtroom experience includes numerous motions, self, several full-blown trials, and he's also had the privilege of winning a major family law victory at the Ontario Court of Appeal in 2014. Uh, Bill, what was the name of that case again? Well, it's McConnell and Huxtable. It's a limitations case. Amazing. So that prevented uh, the imposition of a proposed two-year deadline on property claims by common law spouses. So when he's not practicing family law, he loves spending time playing music with his band, Soul Custody. And that's, now, that, that's now parenting time, right, Phil? Right. <laughs> Soul decision-making responsibility. <laughs> but it's spelled yeah. S-O-U-L. You got you to keep up with the times, Bill. <laughs> Um, and finally, Russell. So Russell is the founder and senior partner of Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. With over 20 years of experience, Russell offers a wealth of knowledge and expertise in collaborative family law. He uses his experience with a client-focused approach by creating unique solutions for each of his clients to enable them and their families to move forward with their lives in a compassionate and collaborative manner. So now that you know a little bit more about our team and what we have on the agenda for today, I would love to pass things over to you, Russell, to start our presentation. Yeah, you got soul, Bill. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who attended. Great turnout. Almost 200 people signed up for today. Um, we're going to do some polls. Our feedback, our, our audience members like the polls. We're going to do Q&A, of course. Um, do we have a, a, a guarantee today, Steph? How's that work? Of course. As always, we would love to offer our full money-back guarantee um, on our free virtual webinar. So if you two want to take advantage of that, you can let me know. And we've got a couple of teasers today. We're going to talk about one in a minute, but yesterday was April 19th. So that's sort of back to school day for lawyers, right? We're ordered back in person by Chief Justice Morowitz. I think I've got the first decision that talks about the presumptive guidelines. Uh, the endorsement came in yesterday afternoon. We're going to put a link into that at the end of today's program. So stay tuned for that. But let's run a poll, as we always do. What's your reason for joining us today? Give everybody a few minutes just to put their answers in, and we're going to go to our next slide while we're waiting. Um, we also have the um, a free common law separations rights and obligations ebook that we're going to present to provide to everybody 
uh, at the end of the, today's program. This is based on the uh, 101 program that we did, the basic overview of common law with Bill and Adam. So thank you guys for your contributions. Today's 201, so we're going to do a deeper dive, go into some advanced top uh, topics. But at the end of today's program, if you could please provide us with your feedback in the survey and maybe a suggested topic uh, for a future live event, we're going to send you a free copy of the ebook. So um, look for that. Today's topic actually was suggested by an audience member. So uh, we do follow up with the suggestions. So let's take a look at where our audience is coming from today. So 68% law professional. Well, you're going to want to look for that link for that decision on returning to in-person. Um, professional in another field, 18%. Currently going through a separation, 11%. Um, helping a loved one, 1%, and other. So you can put your other in the uh, chat box and let us know. So thank you for that. And let's get into it. Definition of spells. We're going to do a quick overview and review of the 101 topics, and then we're going to do a deep dive into trust issues. Bill, what are we talking about here? Well, um, spouse has traditionally uh, been defined as uh, someone who's married um, to, to the other person or has cohabited continuously uh, for no less than three years or um, has a child with the other person is as in a uh, uh, relationship of some permanence and uh, I think everyone probably knows uh, 2020 that decision Clymans and Latner um, uh, Ontario Court of Appeal uh, C-L-I-M-A-N-S you can't miss it um, they didn't actually live together that much they stayed over couple nights a week maybe but uh, they didn't cohabit and yet they were found to be spouses because uh, they were engaged he'd given her a gigantic engagement ring they introduced each other to their respective children and they held themselves out as a couple so i think cohabitation is not required anymore after that yeah, I agree. Um, but it's always keep it. There's a definition they just put it up for us right here. So always my, keep keep in mind um, when you're dealing with these claims, you need to assess whether or not the person's spouse is defined by the Family Law Act before you go to the next step. So let's go into our next poll. Thank you, Bill, for that summary. Does being married make a difference whatsoever to support? Usually we have five or six answers. This is a binary decision. So you're either gonna get it right or you're gonna get it wrong. So yes, it's easier to get support if you're married. No, being married makes no difference. So this is kind of a, an interesting question. You only have one of two choices. We'll give everybody a moment to uh, put their answer in. And thank you everybody for answering the first poll. Okay, so let's see what we've got for uh, 37%, yeah, 63%, no, interesting. All right, so spousal support revisited. Real quick, Adam, what do you, what's the answer to this question yeah. and what are we talking about? Yeah, thanks, Russ. I really don't think there's any um, major difference between being married and being in a common relationship when it comes to spousal support. Um, again, um, when we're talking about being married, you're looking at... Um, the Divorce Act of federal law. Um, when we're looking at common law relationships, we're looking at Family Law Act, which is a provincial law. Again, it still uses the spousal support advisory guidelines, um, whether or not we're looking at divorce couples or common law couples. Uh, again, this is not the, not the main topic for today, but it's just something to, to consider. Um, and again, just like with married couples, um, common law couples will look at different factors like the length of the relationship, um, the duration, um, whether or not there's children, um, the ages of the parties upon separation. These are all different factors that need to be accounted for when we're looking at whether or not there's going to be spouse support and the length and the, and the amount. Um, and as we put up on the screen here, we have a lot of different resources that um, all of our, our listeners and our viewers can um, can check out, whether that be podcasts, YouTube videos, um, or, or our, our blog posts that we go into more detail. Yeah. 
the uh, and all the all links to all this information is going to be provided in the show notes at the end of the program so if you're wondering how do you access this these resources we're going to provide you with that thank you uh, adam all right so let's get into the meat and potatoes we put aside uh, lots of time to do a deeper dive into property claims for common law um, spouses so bill what are we looking at today well, Russ, as you know, I always like to look at the history of, of the law. And uh, when it comes to common law separations, uh, we have the law of equity to thank uh, for the fact that property division is possible. Um, and that is because the court of equity created uh, the concept of trusts a thousand years ago in England. And uh, the court of equity, which used to in a separate building to like the 1800s they merged them together but it's still a separate area of law and equity is uh, traditionally known as the keeper of the king's conscience its purpose is to mitigate the unfairness that can occur in regular law and a perfect example of that is uh, unmarried people don't get at least in Ontario, they don't get property equalization. And that um, can be very unfair. So equity jumped in and using the trust weapons that equity created, such as the joint family venture, property division can happen with unmarried people. All right, so let's talk about resulting trust, Bill. Um, what What... I have an idea, but tell us about resulting trust, right? This is usually you dump some money into the property, yeah. right? Maybe a classic example is one spouse has bad credit, right? And so the bank says, okay, we've got to put it in the other spouse's name and maybe the other spouse and their parents just to qualify for the mortgage. But the one with bad credit still puts, you know, 20 grand into the property. And the idea is, you know, they're going to transfer it over once the credit clears up. So, but that creates a resulting trust, right? Yeah, it, it, it can. It, um, and I mean, the resulting trust is sort of, it's, it's not the main weapon um, for common law separation. It, I look at it as more of the, the no-brainer trust. Um, uh, the leading case is, is called uh, PCOR and PCOR. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's 2007 Supreme Court uh, decision. And basically, uh, the issue of, of resulting trust arises when A transfers property to B gratuitously, i.e. for no consideration, and then later on, A wants it back. And the law says A can get it back. A is entitled to get it back unless B can prove that A intended it as a gift. So that's where the fight takes place. Um, and the on, again, the onus is on the person who received the money to prove uh, it was meant as a gift. So there's a lot of uh, fights on that issue with the resulting trust. But in terms of the trust claims we're going to examine today, this is probably the simplest one to understand, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the joint family venture is the big one for, for okay. uh, unmarried people, but a resulting trust is, often comes into play as well. I think I'm going to throw this audience question in uh, because it kind of ties in neatly with resulting trust. Uh, well, maybe not neatly, but uh, audience question is what happens if a property was purchased during a common law relationship by just one person? Does that partner have a right to it in case of a separation? Short answer, Bill? Oh, yeah. that That's where uh, it's not a resulting trust. That's where you get into... Um, we're going to Joint talk about that ventures. with yeah, yeah, yeah. Joint Family Ventures, that. right? Yeah. Or J, yeah, okay. JFV. JFV. Or you can yeah. just a regular constructive trust as well with either one. All right. Great summary, Bill. So let's do another poll. It's been too long. Poll number three. What do we got on the screen here? Um, uh, which one? Marks. Are the which one of the four hallmarks of a joint family venture, or which which is not sorry, one of the hallmarks of a four of a of a joint family venture? So we're going to actually answer this, but let's see what our audience thinks. Mutual effort, economic integration, location of the parties, actual intent, priority of the family. 
All right. Uh, so thank you for that poll. Let's see what our audience thinks. All right. Location of the party, 74%. I think that's probably the right answer. Adam? Yeah, let's let's delve into it a little bit deeper to see if right. that is the correct answer. So joint family uh, venture. So, right sorry, go ahead. Let's go through the joint family venture. No, it's it certainly that's the location is not one of the hallmarks, but Adam is going to talk about the four hallmarks that actually do exist. Yeah. Floor is yours, Adam. I'm sorry, we keep uh, cutting my, you off. My presentation. <laughs> All right, let's go through the joint family venture, which is a trust claim, as uh, Bill has previously mentioned. So the joint family venture occurs when during the relationship, both parties contributed to the accumulation of family wealth. And there is an unjust enrichment that arises if the parties separate and one party retains a disproportionate amount of the accumulated wealth. When a claim for a joint family venture is primarily made uh, by unmarried spouses. Um, there are some times when married spouses who cohabitated for a lengthy period of time prior to marriage may also bring this claim. The main case that deals with the issue of uh, joint family venture is called Kerr and Bernal, and this is a, su a Supreme Court of Canada case. And in this case, uh, the Supreme Court emphasized that there, while there is not a closed list of relevant factors, it did highlight four key considerations when determining whether or not the parties were engaged in a joint family venture prior to their separation. And these are referred to as the four hallmarks, which, which Russ has previously mentioned. Uh, the first of the four hallmarks is, is known as mutual effort. And to determine whether or not there was a mutual effort between the parties in the accumulation of wealth, the court will consider the following. Whether the parties worked collaboratively towards common goals, if the parties pooled their effort and worked as a team, whether the parties mutually agreed to have and raise children together, and the duration that the parties cohabitated. And an example of a mutual effort was discussed in the case of Farkas and Bedich, where one party purchased the motel five years before commencing a relationship with the other party. And mutual effort was demonstrated by the party's collaborative teamwork in renovating and operating the motel. The courts will also consider whether there's non-monetary contributions to the accumulation of the party's wealth. So for instance, in the case Rutke and Kabiaki, one party contributed more funds to the party's joint bank account, while the other party contributed primarily through labor during the relationship. This was also seen as a mutual effort. The second hallmark is known as economic or financial integration. To ascertain the degree of independence the, and integration that characterizes this relationship, the parties, the court will consider whether or not the parties integrated their finances and to what extent, whether or not they had joint accounts, whether or not they held jointly held assets, and whether or not they had a common pool of savings. So for example, in the case of Sullivan and McCarthy, 2017, uh, the courts found that the transfer of funds from one party to the other in order to pay bills was found to constitute a financial integration. The third hallmark is known as actual intent. The court will consider whether or not the parties made a conscious and deliberate choice to participate in the economic integration and may examine whether or not the parties' um, conduct indicated that they intended to share their wealth and what for what they had uh, accumulated together. The party's relationship reflected a partnership in a social and economic sense. If the parties ever accepted or referred to their relationship as something that is equivalent to a marriage. Whether the parties held themselves out as married to other people. Whether the parties held title or joint tenancy to any kind of property. And whether or not the parties planned for property distribution upon death, whether or not there was a written will or a verbal discussion. The fourth hallmark is known as the priority of the party. To determine whether or not the parties prioritize their family in their decision making, a court will contemplate if one party exhibited a detrimental reliance on the success and the stability of the relationship for the sake of the family or for economic security, left the workforce to raise children, relocated for the benefit of another party's career 
thereby giving up their own employment, sacrifice their career, career advancement or economic or educational advancement or economic advancement for the benefit of the other individual or the family, or accepted underemployment to balance both financial and the domestic needs of the family unit. Now I should note, it is not necessary to have all four of these hallmarks present to establish a joint family venture. But in the leading case of Kerr and Baranow, uh, the courts found that um, uh, the courts found that there are not a checklist of conditions for finding um, that the parties were engaged in a joint family venture. Rather, they were simply they simply provide a way to establish uh, an analysis of the evidence uh, and some examples of the relevant factors needed to be taken into into account. So, what we can garner from that is it really goes. It's really a case by case, fact by fact scenario by fact scenario basis that the courts will look at whether or not they've been able to establish uh, a joint family venture. And it's going to be on the onus of the party seeking the joint family venture to go ahead and prove those those hallmarks. A great summary, Adam. You know, this provides a good roadmap. So, if you're counsel, right, to start mapping your evidence set in these four categories, there's going to be lots of evidence set there. You know how they filed their tax returns whether they said they were in a partnership you know pooling of the resources who was paying the pills joint account you know, family photos right you know you brought your new partner into extended family for various holidays or weddings or celebrations funerals whatever it is so you know you start ticking off these boxes and you start asking your question your clients questions you know and, and flesh out these details that's really going to improve your claim, what you say, Adam, in terms of convincing a court this was indeed a joint family venture. Yeah, I think I think the more um, of the relevant factors that we've discussed that can be established, the better off, obviously, the person's claim will be. But again, it's a case by case basis, and um, every every fact pattern is different, but the more you can establish these specific hallmarks, the better the better the case would be for, for the joint family. Venture. And it's a balance of probabilities, right? That's our standard of proof in family court. Right. Yeah. Just want to give a shout out and a thank you to my colleague in Ottawa who texted me the link that I just put into the chat box about a recent important decision from the Ontario Court of Appeal regarding resulting trusts. So I know we did sort of a short summary of that, but if you look at that case, uh, that's going to be a good starting point to learn more. Okay, constructive trusts, I think we're over to you, Bill. Thanks, Russ. Um, I like to approach uh, constructive trust by... Let me guess, we're going to go back to the 16th century? <laughs> <laughs> How can it... I'm going to stay away from that, but what's the difference between a constructive trust and a joint family venture? And I'll tell you the difference. Um, the joint family venture actually is a form of constructive trust, a, a new form that was created in 2011. And the difference is, unlike a traditional constructive trust, a joint family venture is not asset specific. On the contrary, it seeks a share of global wealth growth from any and all assets. And you can compare that to um, the seminal Canadian case uh, for a constructive trust, which is 1980s uh, Becker and Petkus, where uh, Ms. Becker got half of Mr. Petkus's farm because there was a clear link between her contribution and the farm's value. And the claim was specific to the farm. It wasn't about anything else. And there probably wasn't much else anyway, but uh, it's a specific claim. Whereas uh, joint family venture goes after global increase in wealth. Um, and the way you move from a constructive trust to a joint family venture is you satisfy as many of those hallmarks as you can. And that is the key that opens the door to the global targeting. Um, and as we talked about at the beginning too, uh, when you do a, a joint family venture, you um, you subtract any benefits that the claimant received uh, from from the award. So it's very it's very labor laborious. Um, uh, the late Phil Epstein used to say, "Like try not to do these; they take forever." You know, uh, but you have to you have to do them because 
uh, unmarried people don't have equalization. So you kind of have to. And the result in a joint family venture uh, claim is unpredictable. It's as Adam said, it's uh, it's a case by case, fact specific thing. Um, there are cases where they came up with a number and there's no real explanation. It's almost random, which confirms the old saying about equity, uh, which is this equity varies with the length of the judge's foot. So you want to draw a judge with a big feet? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, it's very case by case. You can't right. really predict, which is in a way good because it does address the particulars of each case. It's custom tailored, but it takes forever and equalization is way easier. Well, and it makes it yeah, difficult, just... for, th difficult for us, right? Our clients yeah. want some certainty or ballpark. And then what about costs, right? How much does it cost to run one of these trials, Bill? A billion dollars. Yeah. So let me uh, pepper well, that's you. That's what I was going to say, Russ. Go ahead. Sorry, Adam. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, Russ, that, you know, there's a certain amount of certainty um, with equalization yeah. uh, of, of, of marital assets and debts, right? Um, but when when prospective clients or clients come to us with, you know, a fact pattern whereby they were never married and there's, there's all these assets and debts um, and are looking for guidance as to how to deal with it. Um, in all honesty, the law is, is all over the place with, with similar um, uh, trust claims. Um, so it's difficult to be able to provide a client with um, proper advice on these issues. Um, as, as we all know that, like I've said, it's, you know, it's a case by case basis, but you know, sometimes even when you have very similar back patterns, um, you could get wildly different outcomes or opinions from a judge, um, which is not often the case when you get, when you're dealing with equalization, it's more black and white. So, I mean, we're going to talk about, you know, um, how the law can improve, um, a little later on. But um, just this this overall gray area and lack of black and white does cause a lot of issues for people who are not married. It's hard for the lawyers to figure it out. And when we explain it to our clients, they gloss over, right? And it can be kind of overwhelming. A couple of questions that came in. Bill, why is it called a constructive trust? I'm glad you asked me that, Russ. Uh, that's my department. <laughs> I, love the, uh, <laughs> I love the dramatic pause well, it, there. Yeah. Because the, the court is con constructing a trust. And what they're doing is they're saying, um, you are uh, holding an asset in trust for the claimant. You know, the claimant doesn't own any of it on paper, but they're making a trust claim. And so the court constructs a trust and that, that's why they call it that. Yeah. Even Please. if that's not right, Bill, it sounds very believable. <laughs> yeah. I and always... it's weird because it, <laughs> The person who has the trust forced on them, um, like the Becker and Peckis, when uh, he uh, was found to be holding half the farm in trust for uh, for his partner. Um, trust is a funny word because in a normal trust, the person who's holding it can be trusted, and that's why they call it that. But if you have it forced on you, it's sort of ironic because yeah. you can't be trusted, and that's why you tried to run off with everything. The way I kind of thought of it is like you're constructing a house, right? So if you've got labor and time into that particular asset, you should be compensated for it. As opposed to the resulting trust where you paid money in and yeah. now you've got a monetary claim. All right, a couple more quick questions. Thank you for that, Bill. Is there a different limitation period for a joint family venture? Bill? Yeah, um, there is. Uh, if for married people, um, you can bring an equalization claim up to six years after the date of separation. Or if you actually have a divorce come through, then you have two years from that, from a divorce, uh, to bring an equalization claim. Um, if you're not married, uh, then um, to bring a joint family venture claim or, or, or a constructive trust, whichever the case may be, um, if you're targeting real estate, and usually you are, then you have 10 years uh, to bring a joint family venture claim. Uh, if there's no real estate involved, if you're just targeting a business, for example, then 
to be on the safe side, you want to bring the claim within two years of separation. There is some wiggle room there, but to be on the safe side, two years. We're getting some great questions. Two more, and then we're going to move on. Can you make a joint family venture claim even if the parties are married? Yeah, I think I think we hit on that. Yeah. Um, okay. So wait, wait for the answer to that question. Um, that's coming. And uh, we had a we had a question in the chat. This is a, I think this is a tough one, and this may be the subject of a whole nother uh, live event. Bankruptcy and it, its effects on trusts. Well, if the person you're making a claim against is bankrupt, right? The, you're going to be dealing with the trustee and other creditors. But I guess what the question here is, I guess it depends on the stage of the bankruptcy, right? If you're bankrupt, the trustee is going to control the outcome. If you're discharged, uh, that may have a different set of factors in terms of what claims you could pursue. Thoughts on that one, Bill? Um, it's not It's not something I've ever uh, had to deal with, so I don't really, to be honest, I've okay. never run into that person. So yeah. the answer it can't is... can't be good, whatever it is. Can't the answer is contact the bankruptcy lawyer <laughs> and ask him or her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> bankruptcy is never a good thing to have happen. I mean, it, it's hard to get money from someone who's bankrupt. Right. Well, we know the market's gone crazy, right? The real estate market in Southern Ontario and across North America has gone bonkers. So let's talk about the home and these common law claims. So are we going to look at data separation values? We're going to look at market values. You know, it could be, yeah, you go, is... it could be a $600 swing if you separated two years ago, right? Um, so Adam, this is, yeah, this is, yeah, this, this is becoming a, a pretty huge issue um, in family law. Um, you know, like like you said, it, oftentimes parties will separate. You know, three, four, potentially five years down the road. Uh, you know, in the in the past, um, they've been trying to resolve their issues. They may or may not still be living together in the same home, um, and now uh, they're trying to come up with a separation agreement, or they're in court, um, and they're you know trying to prove joint family venture. Um, what value are we using for the home? Are we using today's value? Are we using the value from when they separated a couple of years back? Um, and what the courts have been saying uh, now is that in, in a joint family venture case, assets are often valued as of the date of trial um, or as of the date of you know today rather than rather than the date of separation. This is not a guarantee. Um, there are other aspects when this is not the case. Um, but there is strong support that that this is um, what what the the courts have been doing. Uh, for that's example, that's a fairly in, recent uh, approach, right, Adam? Like two years yeah, ago, yeah, they were going yeah. to the separation, but we've got some recent case law. It's going to be in the show notes where we're seeing. Yeah. So in the case of yeah, so in the case of Gonzalez, uh, the court found that when there was a joint family venture and they looked at a subject pro uh, the property. Of, they look at the the value as of the date of trial and not separation. And the difference in that case, the home was valued six hundred thousand dollars more as of the date of trial than it was at the date of separation. And the court stated in that case that if there are inflationary increases in housing prices that are available to a title holder, there is no principled reason to withhold them from the proper claimant under an unjust enrichment or joint family venture claim. Uh, so they really see it as um, if you can make these claims and there's no reason why they would treat you any differently than being a proper title holder on that property. Those cases scare me. Um, you know, if you're representing, oh, yeah. if you're representing the owner, right, this, this is a huge risk. You're going to roll a trial, you're going to run a trial and have a $600,000 swing on one issue. It's going to affect your offers to settle. There's going to be cost consequences. You know, it's probably an appropriate case to come up with some type of resolution uh, because there's so much uncertainty. And I think the court may have gotten it wrong. So, I, and we were talking about this. The, the basis, right, we're looking at enrichment and deprivation. Where is the deprivation when the market value goes up? Like, how is that, you know, Bill, help me out with this concept because you didn't agree with me. You know, we're just, the, the court well, again says, again I, I i see what you're saying um but if, if you've got 
I think the depri- you look at the deprivation as what occurs after they break up, um, which is a different way of looking at it, but you can make that argument. And if you've got a very clear link between the claimant and the home or and other assets as well, which typically involves, you know, caring for the children while the other person goes out and works and stuff, that's that's the strongest link. Um then why shouldn't, you know, then they break up. Why shouldn't they participate in, in the increase in value of the home that they contributed to? There's a very clear link to uh, to that property. Um, and, and that case, by the way, uh, refers to about half a dozen other cases where they did the same thing. So it, there, there is a lot of case law, but if there's a strong link, I think it's it's fair. But if, if the link's not very strong, then it's it's unfair. You've got to look at each case. But you're going to get it. Yeah, I think if you're going to, I think if you can establish, I think if you can establish um, a lot of a lot of aspects from the, from the hallmarks that we've talked about. Yeah. You know whether or not they've given up a job to be home with the kids, or if they've or, or if they've moved from one area to another to be with this person. Yeah. Um, they put their life you, you can, into you the can, relationship. You, yeah, you can make you could you could realistically make arguments that they've been deprived from, um, of of making you know of of increases in value for their sacrifices right um i mean you would have to make those arguments but i think that's what you'd have to you'd have to yeah. you'd have to argue all right so let's pretend for a moment i still but don't i agree with but i agree with you russ <laughs> let's pretend for a moment i still don't like it what 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 are the fact scenarios where the judge is going to say we're going to go with data separation value we're not going to go with market value when the links are weak weak is that what you're suggesting bill uh, yeah, I mean, it links to the so, specific yeah. asset, not the relationship. Well, it's it, in the joint family venture. The link is to all assets, as we've said. But yeah, it, it it's always. I mean, children are the big indicator to me. Like, if there's no kids and the, the claimant really didn't contribute much and didn't give their lifeblood to the relationship, and there's there's not that much of a link between them and and owning the home. You know, relatively um, short relationship. Yeah, then 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 it wouldn't be fair for them to get to participate in the in the increase but uh, again if there are it's usually kids and and just being all in in the contributions overall yeah. yeah so i think you're right russ if there if there's no kids and no link then i think a court would not do that but you're rolling the dice right it's a gray area and you never yeah. Yeah. anybody who's run a trial you know you think your evidence is going to come out a certain way and it doesn't right <laughs> And now you've you're, you've exposed your client to some significant liability, or if you're or if you're pursuing yeah. the case, right? There, that's six hundred thousand is enough to fight over, right? Best case scenario, in my opinion, would be just be to try to resolve it without obviously going to trial and coming up with a number that both parties are ha- relatively happy with to, to move forward with. It's a risk on both yeah. sides, right? Yeah, lots of money is going to get flushed down the toilet in terms of legal fees, arguing over that. And you're not going to recover those fees. And the case may be subject to an appeal, which could delay the resolution two or three years further down the road. All right, so we've gone long enough without a poll. Let's get back. <laughs> Let's get great discussion, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, Let's go to our next poll question. We have it on the screen. Are common law couples entitled to CPP division upon separation? So we've given you three options. It's not a binary choice this time. Um, yes, no, or it depends. And we'll give everybody a moment to answer. We did get some questions in the chat box. Thank you everybody for sending in all the comments. Uh, somebody is looking for the case that we just mentioned with respect to um, current value of the home. All that's gonna be in the show notes that you're gonna get at the end of today's uh, presentation. So you get a follow up with the links in the references to the cases um, and the citations. So that's coming. Um, This is kind of an interesting question. Does it matter if one moves out and no longer contributes to the home? So I I guess the question is here, you've got your data separation, the common law spouse moves on and now second to inform the court's decision in terms of what value to use. I think that's what we're being asked. Bill? Yes, yes it would. Um, They tally everything up and they call it mutual benefit conferral. 
Um, and uh, in, in the process of doing that, they do take that kind of stuff into account. So, well, I think yeah, there's, what, there's certainly going to be a set off, right? So if one person yeah, is carrying the, the mortgage payments, the property tax, the insurance, and the other person is successful in the claims, they're going to set off 50% yeah. of whatever those notional, well, they're not notional, they're real expenses that they incurred, right? Yep, absolutely. set off is a good way of looking yeah. at it. I, I'm, I have a similar follow with with this, you know, similar back pattern. And we were told that um, if there's because because there may or may not because there might have been a, a spousal support claim um, for the for the party um, who may be getting the the credit um, on their behalf, then that would that would mean there's really no you don't deal with any set off in terms of any kind of post separation yeah. adjustment. So yeah. if one party may owe the other party spousal support and the other, and they've been, you know, keeping the home together for the past year or two, um, that may offset with yeah. any kind of uh, it's quite, adjustment in terms of the property. It's quite common that those household expenses are fairly close to what a support order would be if you run the, right. the SAGs, right? So, all right, let's see what our audience thinks on this one. Well, 35 yes, 26 no, 39 depends. So fairly evenly split. Um, do we have an answer to this question? I think the answer is yes. I think yeah. that if you're in a, and, and you and you can't you can't really contract out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I know we people have tried to, and it's it's not allowed. Uh, I think if you're in a in a in relationship with more for more than one year, and you and you're separated for more than a year. Um, what I think the law says is that you have four years to request to request the, the credit split. I think mean, that's what the law says about that. You need to make the application, right? Now, when we first did the one-on-one yeah. -on -one session of this program, we talked about pensions. I said I know of no cases <laughs> where somebody successfully claimed, uh, made a claim against somebody else's pension, and now I'm eating crow. I'm going to be updated here by Bill, but... At that time, there wasn't any case law, and I think Adam finally came across a case he was litigating that um, Justice Kraft made the order, and not a lot of analysis, but um, that litigant wasn't really playing nice and got the book thrown at him. That's sort of my Coles Notes version, but Bill, let's talk about pensions. Really important subject right now, really um, sort of a growth area for family lawyers. What are we looking at? Well, he, Russ, not only was that guy not playing nice, he didn't show up for the trial. Um, that so doesn't help. <laughs> it really didn't. It didn't help him. And Mel, uh, Justice Kraft uh, laid down 87 paragraphs of, you got to pay, my friend. <laughs> um, so 14 year relationship. It's called, uh, it's in the show notes, it's called Hughes and Vicente 2021 case. There it is. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if it would have been different if the guy had actually turned up at the trial. I forget why he wasn't there, but he might have been struck. I forget. Um, then we can move on to another one. It's called Cloutier and Francis. There it is. Um, that's a 2011 case, um, but it's a bit weird. There's an 18 year cohabitation. Um, there was a joint family venture. Um, and here's the weird part the court ordered. Uh, a payment of fifty-seven thousand dollars within thirty days. The pension was divided only after the man failed to meet the deadline. So, um, so that really that was sort of a security, yeah, payment. It wasn't necessarily yeah. a direct split, right? Yeah, it's it's not a great theoretical support for the idea of going after a pension, but. Um, and then we've got some cases uh, where the pension was not shared, um, SC versus TH. And the court talks about the all important link. And that goes back to, to uh, Becker and Petkus. There has to be a link between the claimant and the asset or the, or the wealth as the case may let, be. Let, let me guess one person stays home and takes care of the kids, the other per that creates a link where the other person yes. can go earn money and save a pension is that the that's idea that's the strongest link absolutely mm -hmm. and in this case uh the, the judge said they, they did share responsibilities but there was uh, no 
a clear link or even an indirect link between the father's contributions and the growth of the mother's pension. So there's that. Um, there's a case called Rowley and Rowley. Um, again, uh, no link. Um, this guy, he tried to get a share of his wife's pension that she she got. She didn't even have it until after they split up when she became a teacher. And he, they just said, no, buddy, like, there's no link between you and the pension. She wasn't even in that job when you were together. So nice try. So basically, you can go after a pension. The cases go both ways, but it's a legitimate target. Again, you have to have a link. So we have, I'm going to, again, be devil. These are great cases, Bill. So you've got, you can argue either way here. But let's say you're married. I know this is a program about common law, but let's say you're married. You've got a property regime according to the legislation in the Family Law Act, right? Can you pull one of these arguments out to say, okay, I want to go predate a marriage when we we're common law and attack the pension for the five years we lived together before we got married? Or are you bound by the legislation? What do you think? Well, as I Adam said, you, you, you can bring a trust claim even if you're married. And as Adam said, it's to cover stuff that happened before marriage and stuff that happened after separation. I've never seen anyone do it in terms of a pension, but why not? If, you, if, it, if you've got a really strong, compelling argument, I, I've never seen it. I could be wrong. Yeah. I think one of the first, when they came in with the new pension legislation, one of the first decisions that went to the Court of Appeal was Simmons and Simmons. In that particular case, they said no. That was several years ago. I did the trial for, um, at the trial level. But I think the court might approach that case differently today in light of the recent case law regarding pensions. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, the door is open in terms of um, making a claim for them. Um, I, I, but again, like like Bill said, the, the, yeah, the link has to be established in order to claim it, right. um, which may or may not be possible for the person. But the door is certainly open. Yeah. All right. And I guess another question is, I, I don't know, do common law, all right, let's move on. I don't want to get too distracted here because I want to save some time for further Q&A. Let's go to another poll because it's been too long. Um, should the Family Law Act to be be amended or provide common law spouses to share, like married spouses, be amended to enable sharing? Yes, share everything. Yes, share but only the home. No, don't share a thing. They weren't married or other. So give everybody a few minutes to put the, um, the responses in the poll questions. And thank you everybody in advance for uh, participating today. Uh, one question came in, would occupation rent be an appropriate set off um, for one of these um, claims? I guess the question is, you know, a increase in the home post separation. We only, you only get occupation rent if you're on title, don't forget. Um, yeah. And you're excluded from your property and it's you never pretty, get it anyway. Until trial. It's a pretty strict test. I suppose you can argue it, but if you have a hearing on and it. And if you're, you're on title. Yeah, and if you're on title, you're going to get today's value right. anyway. In yeah, my opinion. so, so right. it, it's probably a moot point. Yeah, good point. Um, all right, so and it, this 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 poll rest. There's no like like there's no real right answer for this one. It's more just our attendees' opinions as to what they think should should be the case, yeah. um, and then we can discuss further. So let's see what the poll results are. Um, yes, share everything. Thirty-six percent. Only the home. Thirteen percent. No, don't share a thing, 38%. Uh, you know, there's an argument, right? If you're making a commitment and getting married, then um, that comes with a certain bundle of rights that common law spouses don't get to enjoy, right? Um, yeah. It may not be the correct argument, but that's certainly... Unless you're, unless you're in BC. All you have to do is live together for three years and you get equalization certainly seems to be reflected in the poll results. Um, all right, serious subject, um, but it affects common law spouses. Well, legislative reform and other considerations before we get to the next one. Um, I know Phil Epstein, um, the great Phil Epstein who passed recently, 
he's always an advocate for you know fairness and amending the legislation to you know improve property rights for common law couples um what do you guys think you know it, it's it clear up the mess that we're in with pensions right and it clear up the mess that we're in with whether it's current value or data separation um provide some guidance to counsel in the court and it would certainly reduce litigation um bill what do you think of this should we see some legislative reform yeah i mean uh, i i think it, it might help um but uh it's hard it's hard to really say i mean uh then we wouldn't have all the fun that we do have now in doing joint family venture claims right we would we wouldn't be doing live events anymore at least not on that subject uh adam what's your take yeah i mean i think obviously it would provide a lot of clarity to the legal profession as well as the public at large um, right. but like you said russ there then we'd be getting rid of you know the sanctity of marriage and what that means in terms of property rights right so if somebody is going to get married and they're they're they you know they they're signed a marriage you know they have a marriage certificate they're provided with with complete um equality when it comes to separation when somebody who's not willing to, or doesn't want to get married is not so it's really a balancing act in terms of how we'd want to um if we want to make that equal or if we want to say you know what if you're willing to get married or you want to go through the legal process of doing that you have the the utmost protection in terms of, of property rights and i'm sure there's some people who choose not to get married right thinking i don't want to share my assets but i want to spend still want to live with you right so and then you get the prenups and everything else so all right um let's move on to uh our final poll of the day can unmarried spouses sue for the new tort of family violence and we're going to get into this um tort in a moment so um some people may be familiar with this case we'll just leave up that that up there for a minute but bill let's get into well let's see what the poll results are and then we're going to wrap this up with this and go into some q a yes is um the answer is that the correct answer bill yes all right let's get yes, into it yes. Tor torts and Although damages, we'll see, Tor torts we'll and damages in three minutes or less but uh yeah. the floor is yours well the, uh, the, there's a recent case it was they made the papers um uh it's called a and a you can't miss it uh it's created a new tort called family violence um, the wife was awarded 150,000 for it um the court did state it was rare and unusual um and it's under appeal, so we'll see if the tort survives the Court of Appeal. And what's different about this, this new tort called family violence is that it, it's an elongated tort. It occurs over a period of time. As the court said, quote, the uniquely harmful aspects of family violence are not adequately captured in the existing torts. Uh, the existing torts are focused on specific harmful incidents, while the proposed tort of family violence is focused on long-term harmful patterns of conduct that are designed to control or terrorize. And that's what happened in this case. It was a 16-year reign of terror. There were three incidents of uh, bad physical violence, um, which were, were compensated. And the judge said, well, if the tort of family violence gets overturned, uh, we can still use the tort of assault, which has been around for a long time. Um, also, an interesting example here of course of control which, uh, and if that tort doesn't survive, then it's going to be intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is the traditional tort. Um, the husband had complete financial control here. Uh, the wife gave him all of her earnings. As late as 2011, she still didn't have a cell phone. He repeatedly threatened to leave her and the children penniless. And the court talks about the silent treatment where he would not talk to her for months at a time. It was a reign of terror. And that's, and that's uh, especially with the financial control, it's a good uh, example of this coercive control, which is a, a new concept that's kind of come into our law in the last couple of years. And uh, the definition of family violence uh, was taken out of the Divorce Act. That's what is the basis of this case. 
And that exact same language was cut and pasted into the Ontario's Children's Law Reform Act. So yeah, you could sue for the tort of family violence, even if you're not married. Yeah. So, and, you know, and, and Bill, go ahead, Adam, sorry. Sorry, just, just, just to jump in, this, uh, this $150,000 um, award uh, was, a, we should note, above and beyond any kind of property division or, or, or spousal support claims. Yeah, that's right, um, exactly. It was for pain and suffering. It was punitive as well, part of it. Um, and uh, the court did say you can all, again, if the tort of family violence doesn't survive the court of appeal, you can still go back to the old torts of assault, um, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And if you do that, um, you have to get them all tried together in the same family law action. So you can always do that and still can. Raises a bunch of questions we're not going to get into in terms of, you know, bringing in personal injury lawyers and having them run it on a contingency fee. How the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board may um, come into play. We're often representing people who have either uh, been a victim and their spouse has been charged with criminal conduct or vice versa. Uh, so if you're practicing family law, this is something, if, and your client's been a victim of domestic abuse, you may want to include a claim uh, pursuant to these torts. And I see Steph is back. Welcome back, Steph. Thank you. It's been a wealth of knowledge right now since I'm smoking it all in. Uh, so Russ, I don't know if you want to move along to our question and answer. Yeah, let's, let's try to get a question and answer in. And um, All right. So I'm just going to quickly remind everyone um, before we get into that, that mm -hmm. we We'll be having a survey that pops up in your browser following the webinar. So if you do have time, we welcome and appreciate any feedback you have. Um, we also appreciate any suggestions on topics. Uh, we use that to continue to grow our virtual event series. Um, and as a sign of appreciation, those who provide their feedback and offer a topic suggestion will receive a complimentary advanced copy of Russell's new ebook on common law separations. All right, so um, I did see one question come in, uh, if you have time. Uh, how much in legal fees does it cost to have a trial of trust issues? Well, more than you want to spend. Generally, uh, a hundred grand, hundred grand each. $5,000 a day, you're, it would be conservative. And I think you'd probably be into it for a five day trial, wouldn't you say, Bill, if we had some complicated trust issues, maybe even longer. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of money. If, if, you know, if you're fighting over a lot of money, then it's worth. It. Yeah, and that's and that's just the trial, right? You don't you don't wake up and start a trial right away. You, it takes several um, potentially years um, to get to a trial, uh, whereby you have to go through several court appearances. Um, just to get there. So you're looking at the trial costs as well as all of the costs up until that up until that time. And now you're going to well, court in person. The link is in, in the box if you want to learn more of it. The decision that came out yesterday requiring us to attend in person. So that's another factor as well. So I think, what do you think? One more stuff or is that it? Well, I'll do one more quick fire. Uh, so do common law parents have the same rights as married parents when it comes to parenting? Adam? Yes, yeah, I, I don't think there's any real difference in terms of um, when, when it comes exactly, to parenting. Exactly the same. Yeah, it's, it's the same. And like we talked about at the beginning with Bill's, um, Bill's band name, um, we, don't, we don't look at custody uh, anymore. We really look at um, decision making and, and residency now rather than uh, custody. Bill, your, name that used to be the, the, your band yeah. is so old school. Okay, twelve fifty nine. Let's wrap this up, Steph. All right. Well, thank you again, Adam, Bill, and Russell, and thank you to everyone in the audience for taking the time to join us today. We hope you found the content helpful, and keep an eye out for that follow up email with links to helpful resources mentioned in today's presentation. Uh, we'll be sending that out to you tomorrow. If you do have any questions about our event series or any comments for our team, please feel free to reach out to my colleague Shannon at russellalexander.com. We do host our virtual event series bi-weekly and our next presentation on Wednesday, May 4th will be on divorce, 
domestic violence and narcissism. So registration is now open for that and we'll be including a full list of our upcoming webinars in our follow up email as well. So thank you everyone for attending today and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. That's a great job, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Adam, Bill, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time today. And one o'clock on the dial. Look at that. Perfect, Steph. Great job. Thanks. Have a good day, everybody.